Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hello everyone and welcome to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. Let's get started. Today, I am joined by Dr. Marika Lettingham, director of the Well Worker Project. She is also a psychologist and burnout specialist. In today's episode, we are talking all about burnout and how and why we should overcome it. Let's get started. Hi, Marika. How are you? Hi, Tia. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for being here. Now, your profession is quite multifaceted from what I've read so far. So for those who don't know you, do you mind explaining a bit about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. Well, I've been a psychologist for over 20 years now, and I've worked in all kinds of areas of mental health. So lots of treating adults and teenagers for um, disorders like anxiety and depression. Um, But over the last 10 years, I've really been focused on the workplace and the kind of the stress and the burnout and the bullying and other kinds of things that can um, impact you in the workplace. And so um, around 10 years into my career, I started a um, PhD on burnout um, in health workers. And since then I've been really you know, interested in how to make work better. Um, So um, now I have a private practice where I treat people who are experiencing burnout and other workplace issues. And I've also got a business called the Well Worker Project where we help um, leaders um, develop better um, workplace wellbeing in their organisations. Oh, that's so interesting. So how did you end up sort of going to, like leaning towards burnout and learning about workplace burnout specifically? Yeah. Well, it really started um, when I was working in Ireland, Dublin in Ireland, and I was working in a mental health program, a day program for people with quite complex mental health issues. Mm. And I just remember the conversation around burnout there and how everyone kind of said, oh, yeah, you only last in this job for a couple of years and then you'll burn out. And I remember thinking yeah, wow. as a fairly young psychologist. <laughs> this not what is, you want to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, I just remember thinking, wow, we're sort of trained to deal with mental health and well-being, and yet we're all going to fall victim to this eventually. And it seems sort of crazy to me. Um, so that's really what started my interest in it. And I felt like I wanted to just dedicate a few years to, um, to learning about what we can do to better prevent burnout. Yeah. Um, so that's really what got me started. And then I, w- I um, worked in academia for about 10 years as well, researching and lecturing in the, in the area of burnout and um, mental health. Oh, wow. That's amazing. How did you end up in Ireland? <laughs> that's, a very, that's quite yeah. far away from Perth. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I mean, growing up in Perth, you can feel like life is a little bit limited. Um, and so I managed to get a little claustrophobic there sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) I managed to convince my elder brother to come with me, um, to Ireland. And we, I got my first job over there as a psych. Um, he was working in HR, but, um, yeah, so we were there for five years, but I never managed to bring him back because he fell in love with an Irish girl. So he's still there. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, I really want to go to Ireland. It's like a big dream. It's a pretty special place. It looks so pretty and just so kind of, I don't know, magical, but anyway, (laughs) moving on. Okay. So, um, 
Now I'm going to ask Marika some get to know the guest questions. So this is essentially just for the listeners to learn a little bit more about mm-hmm. the experts and sort of bring them down to the human level. So I'm going to ask you five questions. You ready? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So the first question is what is a recent book you have read? Well, I read a lot of books. I'm a real bookworm, but um, one Ooh. of the recent ones I've read was um, called Quiet by okay. Susie Kane, and it's about introversion and I guess how we can um, harness the powers of our introversion in a, in a sort of a world that is really um, aimed towards extroversion. Um, I found it really useful for myself as, a, as an introvert, but also for my clients too who, um, who tend to work in introversion and how they can sort of best manage their energy levels, um, how they can be more productive as an introvert and those kinds of things. So I found that really, um, really good. And there's another, there's a book coming out very soon that I'm very excited about and it's called The Burnout Challenge and it's by the two leading researchers in burnout, um, Christina oh, cool. Maslach and Michael Leiter. Exciting. Yeah. And both of them are just, yeah, extremely um, smart and dedicated to the area of burnout, but also really mm-hmm. generous um, practitioners too. So, yeah, looking forward to that one. Cool. Yeah, I love looking forward to a book release. This is not... Yeah. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite surreal. Yeah. Okay. So my second question is, uh, what is a movie you would recommend? Well, I don't watch too many movies these days. Um, but I watched, um, one, the end of last year called the stranger. I don't know if you've, okay. you've heard of that one nice. and it's an Australian movie and it has, um, Joel Edgerton in it. And the, the topic oh, yeah. is quite, um, is quite dark in, ter- in that it's around the, um, the disappearance and murder of a young boy in Australia. Um, oh, okay. But the, the reason why I really liked that movie was it was about the undercover detective who actually catched, uh, uh, went undercover and, and caught the murderer. Um, and really the impacts that that particular project or um, task had on him and how his internal experience of having to talk to this murderer about horrible things that he'd done um, was so incredibly removed from how he, you know, how he had to um, show his reaction to to the murderer. So um, that tension between how he felt and how he had to act was was really tough on him. Um, and it sort of showed the impact of how easy it was for him to parent and, you know, um, and his life, his personal life in general. So, yeah, really found that very based interesting. On a true story or it sounds like um, it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah. I was going to say, most Australian films are, um, we've got some funky people down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's based who's on a true story. Who's the second psychologist I've had on today who's, um, told me about their, their love of a true crime film or podcast. I can see how from like a, a psychological yeah. perspective, that would be very fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my third question is, um, who is your famous role model? If you have one, not everybody does. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I really, there's people I admire certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, and Adam Grant is one of them. He's an organizational oh, yeah. psychologist and he, yeah. um, he does the, um, the podcast work life. And mm-hmm. I just find him just, uh, just really vulnerable and really open, um, really always wanting to learn, um, really inclusive. He's just sort of someone that I aspire to, to be like, I suppose, yeah. in my everyday life. Yes. And he's really yeah. smart too. <laughs> that's always nice um now you may have just answered this question but what is your favorite podcast uh well i have a lot but i think the favorite one for me at the moment is the psych health and safety podcast um the australian version um because there's a lot happening around workplace well-being and that that podcast has a lot of really interesting guests um talking about workplace well-being 
and the way forward. So I, um, yeah, I love that one. Um, but also Adam Grant's and um, a few other psych related podcasts that I enjoy. Oh, cool. Do you listen to any just kind of like no. for fun or you're, this is educational purposes only? A podcast yeah. that's only <laughs> educational for me. Yeah. I like it. I like it. That's yeah. cool. Um, and my fifth and final question is a course you have completed recently, if you have, or just one you've completed yeah. ever. <laughs> that's very bad. Uh, question. I think, I mean, after doing a PhD, I think you run out of steam for, for doing more. Um, you know, formal imagine, training, yeah. but um, <laughs> yeah. as a psychologist, you continually updating your skills. Um, yeah. This year, I've managed to go to a few face-to-face conferences, which have been really great oh, on cool. um, workplace well-being, and yeah. there's one I went to recently on doctors' health, um, particularly, and that's an area that I have a lot of interest in: is helping uh, medical professionals avoid burnout. Um, yeah, so, so both of those experiences were really good and refreshing in terms of my knowledge and um, excitement for the area. Yeah, that's so cool. I love, yeah, everything in your life. You're so passionate about this area, which is great, which is why <laughs> yeah. you're on the show today. So yeah. um, as we've already mentioned, we're discussing burnout and more specifically burnout related to our professional lives, you know, our work, our jobs, etc., yeah. and mainly how it affects our personal, yeah, our personal productivity. Mm-hmm. So for our listeners, Marika, how would you define personal productivity? Well, um, I think most of us psychologists like to look at um, the whole person rather than, you know, our output or that kind of thing. So I tend to think productivity is about doing meaningful tasks, the tasks Mm -hmm. that are meaningful to you personally, um, that are aimed towards a meaningful goal um, without without sort of sacrificing your physical and emotional um, and cognitive well-being. Interesting. That's definitely the most diverse definition I've heard so far. <laughs> Everyone kind of has their own take on it, uh, which yeah. is nice. And I think that's, that is so much of what productivity kind of means is that, you know, being productive for someone else is not going to work for everybody. Yeah, um, that's right. But yeah, and especially, yeah, when we're talking today about burnout, it's about mm. being able to, yeah, be your best self and work towards your best self without, mm. um, yeah, kind of killing yourself in the process. Yeah. So, over the course of your experience, um, what do you think people get wrong when it comes to personal productivity? Um, I think what I see a lot is people tend to um, assume that they can um, sustain high levels of yeah. um, stress and intensity and pressure and workloads yeah. and environments for a long period of time. Um, but you can't, you just can't because the way that our stress response um, works is that eventually that will start to have an impact on your whole body. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, people also assume that, oh, I just got to get through this and then things will calm down. And actually most of the time that doesn't happen. Most of the time <laughs> yeah. there's more tasks that come. Yeah. Um, and so that, that magical time where things calm down really never happens until we consciously set limits and boundaries and really have a yeah. sort of strategy around that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, we're always kind of thinking, oh, okay, like, you know, the payoff later, the payoff later, yeah. and, you know, yeah. it's like I'm a fifth year in law school now, so it's a lot of the, the payoff later, the payoff later kind yeah. of conversations so, that are going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I see a lot of, you know, I, I see a lot of um, doctors and lawyers in my practice and, going through that intensity of that study and then launching yourself into a really high pressure career as a junior, um, you often find people burn out, you know, a few years into that career because they've sustained it for so long and then they're, you know, adding to it and their responsibility is getting higher and higher. Yeah, exactly, because it only 
gets more difficult yeah and then yeah and they're like oh the payoff will be great and i'm like by the time we get to the payoff i'm gonna be like 50 <laughs> I'm, like, I'm really in my 20s i don't want to have to wait yeah. like, that long to get some kind of magical payoff where i'll get to do nothing only for like yeah. the next 40 years if i'm lucky so how um, to sort of figure out how we can get the the payoff in small moments yeah. right now i suppose exactly exactly thank goodness for school holidays <laughs> yeah um so going back to burnout um before we kind of get further into that discussion for the listeners how mm -hmm. would you define burnout like what does it mean from your perspective well it's not a psychological disorder it's it's a workplace phenom phenomenon that's always a difficult word to say um and the world health organization has recognized it um, it's recognized internationally now as a workplace phenomenon um, but so that means that sort of it, it occurs in the context of work um, and it's also widely accepted that there's three parts to burnout one of them is feeling emotionally um, drained and exhausted the second one is feeling cynical or negative and the third one is feeling less capable, less um, able to do a good job at what you're doing. So there's these three parts that make up that um, the burnout syndrome that sets it apart from other other sort of things that might be going on for someone like depression or, or just stress or that interesting. kind of thing. Yeah, interesting. It's, it's, yeah, I find it, it's fascinating. I was listening to a podcast this morning, just by accident it came up and I was listening to um I think her name Ariana Huffington yeah um she yeah. created the Huffington Post yeah. and she was on um Ashley Graham's podcast who I adore mm -hmm. and they were speaking about burnout because it was one of the first things that came up because obviously yeah. like when she was she changed a lot of the dynamic at Huffington because of like she experienced burnout and it had a lot of medical repercussions that like the doctors at the hospital couldn't diagnose because they were like, there's nothing wrong with you, but also mm -hmm. <laughs> there's yeah. everything wrong with you yeah. the kind of situation. And the, the doctor yeah. that finally came to her and was like, we can't diagnose you with anything. He said, but you have the disease of civilization that we've pushed uh, yeah. humans. Yeah. He's like, we yeah. pushed humans so yeah. far to this point where mm. their bodies are no longer coping with right. like the pressures that you put yourself under essentially yeah. um and so i think yeah, she's a really good example of um mm. ariana huffington she was sort of like most people who are burning out in that she really only um recognized that something was really wrong when she passed out her, at her desk and she yeah. created this big head wound from um sort of fainting on her desk Mm. And and it's often when there's physical symptoms that's when people will sit up and go, hang on, there's something wrong here. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's often before that that we need to actually take action. Yeah, exactly. And I really think that just comes from that kind of like that old kind of culture of just sort of like if there's nothing physically wrong with you, then you're fine. Yeah, you know, like it's yeah. very much, and you, like I, I hear my dad say it, like you know, unless you, like you don't need to Your go to the hospital or the doctor. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit of an Australian kind of yeah. thing. I like it's an international phenomenon, but you hear it, you know, in Australian parents all the time. You know, unless yeah. unless your head's fallen off, then you you're fine. Get get on with it. Um, but yeah, it is quite sad that we kind of have to get to that physical point where our bodies start to kind of rebel and be like you're not supposed to be doing this <laughs> yeah and that, i guess that's um a lot of my research has been on that particular problem of mm -hmm. why is it so hard for people to recognize burnout before their body starts to fall apart and yeah. it's generally because they start to blame themselves they start to think oh i just need to be more you know resilient or i need to have better time management yeah. skills or i need to just um not be so sensitive or whatever yeah um and that stops them from actually recognizing it that stops them from getting help stops them from making changes those kinds of things so that's a real barrier yeah. oh yeah totally and it's something that i've definitely experienced in like my own personal life for mm. a lot of last year 
and even my colleagues can attest to this. I was like sick just like the whole time. Yeah. And I was like constantly sick, constantly injuring myself, just like all the time. Just like yeah. there was always just like this consistent kind of underlying just like grossness mm -hmm. that I felt. And I was always tired, always just and I got blood tests and scans and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they were like, there's nothing like wrong with you. <laughs> so like, yeah. why are you not functioning? Yeah. And then finally my doctor was just like, let me see your calendar. <laughs> she was yeah. like, what yeah. do you actually do? And like, she's been seeing me since like my first year of law school. And she was looking at all of my stuff and, and because I have to be a very organized person just because of my lifestyle and just having like, I have a very intense calendar with like lots of you know, micro scheduling, all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And she was like, you need to, she's like this, all of this needs to go. Yeah. She's like, this needs to be next completely mm -hmm. for like a solid, for like a solid chunk of your time before you can even think about adding back like two mm -hmm. or three things, which is so, I think it's just so hard to do because you think, Oh, I, I must cope with this. this. I can yeah. cope with this. Yeah. yeah. You just think, cause I was like, no, like I have to do all those things. She was like, no, you don't. Mm. <laughs> She's like, no, she's like, you don't have to do that. She's like, just like work and eat and sleep. Mm -hmm. And she's like, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's like, that's, that's a very that's wise all. doctor. Yeah. Yeah. But it took like a whole year mm. of sort of walking around to different specialists before my doctor was like, what do you do every day? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you sleep? <laughs> but um, anyway, so going back to productivity, how does experiencing burnout influence an individual's personal productivity? Uh, well, in lots of ways. Um, one of the big um, symptoms of burnout is withdrawal. So you tend to withdraw from people around you. Um, it's sort of like depression in that way in that when you're suffering from depression, you tend to withdraw um, mm -hmm. from the things that might help you. And the similar thing happens in burnout. Um, so that might mean that you maybe don't collaborate very well or you close yourself off um, to feedback from your boss or from your colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, it might mean that you start to, you know, eat lunch in at your desk instead of in the the lunchroom so you don't have that that chance to get that support from your colleagues and that that sense of camaraderie um you might start to make mistakes so um burnout affects our cognitive function and so we're not able we're not able to perform you know such complex tasks without making mistakes yeah. um you might start cutting corners and that's i think when someone's burnt out that's when they're at risk of um of making decisions that put them in hot water or are a little unethical or get them into trouble yeah. in some way. Um, you might lose hope and lose sight of, of your original personal goals. Um, so you sort of lose that, that drive um, to move forward, which again impacts your motivation and ability to get things done. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There are lots of, lots of little kind of like red flags, but yeah. they all, but I feel like, yeah, cause it's such a, it's only sort of been recognized. I know at least by like world health and all this kind of thing. It's not, mm. it hasn't been, it's not something that's like quite old yet. It's not something that you hear about kind of like in a professional kind of capacity. It's just sort of like, Oh yeah, yeah. I'm a bit burnt out, but it's like, Oh, you know, what does that actually yeah. mean? I think the conversation is definitely changing. I've noticed over the last two years, uh, when I when I started my um, PhD in uh, 2008, I think it was, um, the people you know people didn't know what burnout was. Um, yeah, they were like, "What's what's burnout? Like, what does that mean?" But nowadays, there's a lot more conversation about it. There's actually recognition that burnout is caused by the workplace. Um, yeah, wow. there's a lot of, um, you know, articles in all kinds of, um, media outlets on burnout, people mm. are coming out and talking about their own experiences. So I think that's helping a little bit for, um, to help people recognize when they're experiencing burnout. Yeah. Do you think like, obviously it's hard to tell with like, kind of like the little coverage that it's had 
to sort of like in the past decade. But do you think it's something that people are suffering from more than they were before? Like, do you think this new kind of like generation or this new time, not post COVID, but just like in the past like couple years, mm. do you think it's something that people are struggling with more than they were like, let's say a decade ago? Yeah, I definitely um, think so. And certainly the stats show that. Um, okay. And partly that's because a lot of our work has become sort of automated. And mm. so the work that we're left with is, is all the really um, intense, complex tasks. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so yeah. so if, we, if you cram your day, your week, your year with just intense complex tasks or difficult tasks that a computer yeah. can't do, you can see that that's going to be more draining over time. Um, but also I think the, the pandemic has a big um, role in that people will sort of coped right the way through the pandemic because they had to, they had to get through, through lots of different um, uh, situations and people have run out of steam. And so there's a lot of burnout that's that's coming up now as opposed to during the pandemic because people have coped and they've coped and they've coped and it's gone on for a lot longer than any of us expected mm. and then people are starting to crash now. Yeah, definitely. I think it was there was a noticeable kind of like change in the air, especially going back to uni for the first time, like sort of 2022 was a lot of a lot of people's first time on campus and for myself it was like the first time we'd actually been back in the classroom with people for about two after about two years like we had one nice little semester in there where it was like oh okay and then no and then you yeah. know Melbourne pulled the carpet back out from under us um but it was the first time we kind of done the classroom thing after like two mm. years and you could just feel like everyone was just like really lethargic and the energy mm. was really low even the professors were just like mm -hmm. everyone was just really having a bad time but nobody really knew kind of like what was going mm. on and, yeah um, yeah i mean it was i really was different. running a program at the time and had to move everything online and that's exhausting teaching online and yeah, yeah. Being a oh student online is exhausting um and so yeah i think it's it's all taken its toll that lack of yeah, connection that we've definitely. had definitely and we thought yeah. it was like when we came out of it and we were back at uni and you were like oh great okay back to normal mm -hmm. life off we go and then everyone was just like really tired all the time and everyone mm. like we were talking to each other and we ended up like as a <laughs> just now i don't know if this was like a thing for everyone else but at our uni anyway it was like the post pandemic depression kind yeah. of like everyone was just so exhausted from just like surviving for the mm. past two years and doing law school during that and like exactly. trying to get through that yeah. and get to the other end and then you're expected to produce the same results and it's just like hang on it's just like i just mm. <laughs> i just did that <laughs> yeah like, give me a give me a second and exactly. yeah it was really yeah. weird everyone everyone knew there was something but you couldn't you couldn't exactly yeah yeah mm. it was really weird yeah it was definitely interesting, but, um, yeah. So from a professional perspective, you definitely saw like COVID have that effect on people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, during when COVID first started and so on, there was a lot more sort of presentations of anxiety, but mm. now, um, uh, it's much more around burnout and running out of steam. Um, yeah. uh, you know, for, across all, all kinds of professions. Um, and I think the latest, um, research suggests that, Australia is is one of the countries that's suffering the most. Really? Mm, Interesting. Professionals in Australia really? are feeling extremely okay. burnt out. Yeah. Why why mm. do you think that is? Um it, you know, I wonder whether it could be that our um experience in in Australia has been slightly different to other countries in terms yeah. of, you know, being in lockdown and being protected um and you know yeah, yeah waiting for the inevitable infection of COVID and so on. Um, so we're all living in this sort of state of anxiety for, for a, a long time rather than sort of getting back to our normal community life. Yeah, definitely. We did things, yeah, a little, little differently mm. <laughs> than some other places. We still had it, you know, pretty okay, but um, it wasn't, 
was an idea. At least not here in Melbourne. It was it was pretty. It was yeah. pretty not good. No, no. It was, but it in Perth, it was. Um, yeah, we were we were extremely lucky in a lot of ways. But in some ways, it also prolonged that sense of anxiety of yeah. waiting and watching. Yeah. Exactly. It was not. Yeah, definitely not an ideal um, situation. But mm. yeah, now that we're, it's kind of post COVID, sort of, or at least in Australia, it feels like we're kind of we're post. Yeah. We're all, we're kind of past it. It's still there, but like we're kind yeah. of everyone's just started to just uh, just ignore it because they can't deal with it anymore. I think just from what I've That's heard, right. just from yeah. other people, everyone's yeah. just like, I can't do this anymore. Like, yeah, this yeah. Is exhausting. Then you've got you know a certain pop- portion of the population who are you know you know compromised and yeah, their exactly. life has been you know severely impacted by um, yeah. going back to normal. I suppose. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's definitely, um, yeah, like as much as it's like sort of as much as you want to ignore it to get past it, there's just so many people who are just still being affected by it. You know, like mm-hmm. health workers are still under so much strain mm-hmm. and, you know, people with, you know, elderly or like just immune compromised people. It's just like it's still – there's still that level, but anyway, okay. So getting back to, <laughs> we're going off on a bit, of a, a bit of a tangent here. Um, but getting back to burnout and work-related yeah. burnout. So work for at least in Australia consumes most of our lives and for many people. And mm-hmm. it often can be difficult to kind of not get carried away. And sometimes we lose our work life balance. Does anybody really know what that is kind of situation? Um, and this sort of like culminating into potential burnout. So what are some strategies that we can adopt to avoid experiencing burnout at work, especially when taking into account sort of the factors that are not under our control? Mm. Well, I think you you read a lot of articles um, nowadays about um, doing more mindfulness or, you know, um, doing relaxation or yoga or, you know, that kind of thing. And there's definitely a place for those in terms of, um, having a good self-care routine um, and learning how to um, unwind when you're not at work. But um, burnout is, is a bit more complicated than that because it's really about um, a crisis of your values. So it happens when people are really um, motivated and passionate about what they do and then that passion gets drained away. Um, and so it's not as simple as just being a bit more mindful or being, you know, a bit more relaxed. So it's a bit more complicated than that. But what we do know is that burnout is impacted by um, a few different factors um, in the workplace. And those are autonomy. So having the ability to sort of choose how you do your work or when you do your work, um, those kinds of things. Um, role clarity, so knowing what you're meant to be doing and where your job sort of begins and ends. Um, Work overload, we're all familiar with that one. So that's when there's just too much work to do in the time that you have or there's too much consistent pressure. Like I spoke about before, it's we can't actually sustain um, high pressure for long periods of time because that will cause burnout. Um, so if, if the workload is too high, then that's certainly something that causes burnout. Um, reward. So some people, um, it's really important for them to, for example, get paid, you know, um, a reasonable wage. So you might have seen sort of some, some of the nurses um, going on strike um, because of the, you know, they want more pay because they feel like they, you know, they want to be recognised for the work that yeah, they do. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, a reward could also be, you know, positive feedback or just being recognised for, you know, the things that you do. It doesn't have to be money. It could just be, um, you know, recognition in, in terms of um, uh, people pointing out that they appreciate you. Um and having a lack of community, so that's a lack of connection with the people around you. So like I spoke about before, when you withdraw and you're not spending any time talking to your colleagues or there's no colleagues around, so maybe sometimes, you know, people go back into the office after, 
you know, everyone's been working from home for a long time and there's no one there. There's no one there to talk to. And so they become very isolated. Or maybe there's, you know, a toxic kind of culture and there's a bit of bullying going on or it becomes sort of really unsafe to say when you're not feeling so well and that kind of thing. So that can all impact. And so those areas, those five um, areas, I think that was five. Yeah, that's five. Um, <laughs> they all contribute to burnout. And so what we really need to do is figure out which one of those areas, autonomy, role clarity, work overload, reward and community, which of those are the most stressful to us? Which is our biggest hazard? So if we can take the time to think about, well, for me personally, autonomy is really important, um, which is why I sort of have my own business now, um, why I kind of enjoyed being an academic most of the time, um, because there was a lot of autonomy. That was really important because when I didn't have that sense of autonomy, that created a lot of stress for me, yeah? So that would be the one area that there's some, um, you know, some opportunity to figure out how you can get more autonomy in your work. Um, if you're not so clear on your role, so you don't have that role clarity, um, talking to your manager about getting a better sense of your job description and where it begin begins and ends, for example, and where you can say no to things, or where you can delegate, um, that can really help. Um, you know, lack of community. So thinking about, do you have enough opportunity to connect with people? Um, and if not, how can you create that for yourself? How can you link in with people? So even, you know, I, I know a lot of soul practitioners, uh, psychologists who work on their own, um, but they still need that connection and that's really important to them. So they have to actually make the effort to develop those connections and links with people to get that support. Um, so that would be the first big thing in preventing burnout is becoming aware of the areas in work life that cause you the most stress. Um, and then I would um, think about how you're going to unwind when you're outside of work. So we do actually need to discharge the stress that we've um, accumulated in our body throughout the day. So figuring out how you can do that. Do you do that by being around people that you love or doing some physical exercise? Um, do you do that by being outside in nature or eating a healthy diet? You know, those yeah. kinds of things, you can't ignore those. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I like those, um, those five kind of like the different ones. I yeah. That's so that's very helpful. Yeah. That's sort of the, um, based on the, what we call the JDR model of burnout. So the job demand resource uh, model burnout, um, which a lot of interventions around burnout in the workplace are based on. Um, so it's got a lot of um, good scientific um, background to it. And I guess the, um, the last one would be, uh, there's been a study recently on doctors and um, they found that the, the doctors that spent more time on tasks that they find personally meaningful were much less likely to be burnt out. So it's actually figuring out what is it about your job that you, that you get a buzz out of, that you really enjoy, that you get some meaning out of, and how can you lean into that a little bit more and the other stuff a little bit less. And that's sort of what we call job crafting, where we can create a, a role that contains the stuff that really keeps us alive and vital. Mm. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. I really like that. Those kind of like combinations and I feel like you could, yeah, definitely help yourself using those different things because mm. it's not going to come down to just sort of like one thing or the other, but it's definitely, yeah, a combination of different things and it's going to be unique to each person. Like you said before, you know, having that autonomy or being able to decide um, what to delegate and what to say mm. yes to. And I think I've definitely found it helpful just in this job kind of um, learning where the barriers of my role are, um, just sort yeah. of like as a podcast host, sort of how much do I have to, <laughs> how much do I have to say, um, you know, my input on things or how much mm -hmm. can I kind of lean out or delegate? Mm -hmm. And it's um, definitely yeah, a little bit more 
difficult. I feel like when you have, you know, sort of like leadership roles or sort of roles where you're kind of heading up different things and you call you the face of something, it's like, mm. it's a lot more difficult to say no. Cause it's kind of like, Oh, okay. Is this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And leaders are certainly not immune to, um, to burnout, but mm. it's, um, you know, again, they should have a sense of um, clarity around what their role is and where they can, you know, escalate things. But, yeah. um, also a, a good sense of what personally do they find the most stressful? Do they find conflict the most stressful thing? Yeah. Maybe they could do with some coaching around that or do they find, yeah. um, you know, uh, di yeah, difficult conversations or giving, you know, negative feedback really mm. challenging and how could yeah. they, how could they improve in that regard? Um, so yeah, figuring out for the leaders, what's the most stressful, um, area of their role can help yeah. them. So you mentioned before kind of like stress and stressful situations and all those kinds of thing. And oftentimes burnout and stress are thought to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of those similar traits, but however, yeah. that is not the case. Um, they are, you know, distinct separate things. So what would you say, are, you know, in your professional opinion, what would you say are the differences between these two things? Well, you can't have burnout without stress, but, um, I think a good way to sort of, um, characterize it is that stress involves too much, too much of everything, like too much, um, pressure, too many deadlines, you know, you're over-focused, you've got too much emotional engagement. Um, there's this constant sense of urgency or being in a rush. Um, there might be a lot of energy to get things done. Um, you might have some anxiety, which is like our thoughts sort of speeding up a bit and, and worrying about all possible um, scenarios that might happen. But the thing about stress is that there's an end in sight. Like you said, you know, you sort of think, oh, I'll get through these exams and things will like get better. But with burnout, it, which is the end point of chronic stress, it's characterized by too little. So stress is too much stuff. Too, too many, you know, too much focus and concentration and energy and so on. Because burnout is too little. So that's when we have too little motivation, too little engagement. Um, we sort of lose our care factor, you know. We lose a sense of meaning of what we're doing, um, a sense of hope for what we're doing. We, you know, don't have enough energy. We don't have enough focus and those kinds of things. So I like to... I think about it as like, yeah, too much versus too little. Um, but yeah, burnout being the, you know, very much the end point of a yeah. um, of chronic stress. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The, yeah. The end destination of a rocky road of stress. That's yeah. for sure. Um, so tying into that, what would you say sort of to individuals who claim that they work well under stress and sort of therefore kind of keep it kind of flowing in their lives? Mm. Like, would this not eventually lead to burnout? Yes. Um, so it's true that some people are more productive, um, under stress and, you know, um, depending on their own personal psychology and you often find people who are, you know, for example, have ADHD, they work much better under um, the stress of an impending deadline mm -hmm. um, because it can yeah. motivate yeah. us, it can help us focus. Um, the brain sort of is almost activated to see a threat that's coming and so it pours mm -hmm. all its resources um, into getting something done. But if the stress never returns to a normal level and our body never gets to sort of calm down, then um, eventually that will, you know, lead to burnout. And particularly when you have this stress level that stays high and then you have maybe another stressor, like yeah. maybe, uh, you know, a bad boss or maybe a bit of bullying or maybe there's extra, you know, kind of um, conflict at work and that kind of thing. So that will co combine with this this continual level of chronic stress to, um, to lead to burnout for sure. Um, 
And so that's what leaders really need to be aware of is that you just you cannot have these chronic um, high levels of workload and stress for, for long periods of time and they need to be recognising those high levels and then counteracting, counteracting those high sort of pressure periods with some low pressure periods. Um, yeah. And sometimes even just going into back for your employees and pushing back on deliverables or pushing back on, on deadlines to protect them from yeah. chronic stress. And that's part of the role of a leader. Yeah, exactly. And that's more productive sort of like long-term. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to sort of have consist- people. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Being able to consistently have employees instead of just sort of like having them when they're good and then getting rid of them when they yeah. finally reach their burning point. Um, I'm interested kind of like we're obviously we're here to talk about workplace burnout, but is this something that like parents can also experience sort of like in their parental roles is that kind of like a realm that you've sort of like seen or is this is this am i going off on a different tangent here <laughs> well i mean burnout is discussed in terms of um informal um roles such as caring roles so if you're caring for a family member um or mm. a you know a child it can affect you with similar feelings like losing losing that sense of compassion um and feeling emotionally drained and so on but um, strictly speaking, um, the burnout definition um, relates yeah. to the workplace. Um, yeah. That's not to say that, yeah, people certainly, I've, I've met many clients who also feel that way of, um, of feeling just completely drained and emotionally exhausted and feeling yeah. negative and cynical and so on. Um, oh, so I think, yeah, maybe that's another sort of area of research that needs to happen. Um, yeah but it's not it's not not so much um in the literature at the moment yeah not so defined interesting so moving on to my next question like we've discussed kind of strategies that you can adopt to overcome work you know burnout and those kinds of things but what happens sort of when those strategies don't suffice or for example you know they're overpowered due to external factors like at what point should people take more drastic measures of seeking full change even if that comes at like a more personal risk yeah i think um if your well-being is being impacted um as in your uh, mood or your eating or sleeping pattern is being impacted or you're starting to dread going to work or you have that, you know, funny knot in your stomach when you think about going to work. Um, So if your um, daily functioning is impacted, then you should definitely be doing something about it Um, because the earlier that you can um, intervene with burnout, the the shorter the time it takes to recover from it. and so I think the first thing you should really do is talk to your manager because as we know, burnout is a workplace phenomenon, phenomenon and it doesn't occur without the workplace and therefore you need to involve the workplace with its remedy. Yeah. Um, and I've had a lot of clients who have felt really, really worried about that and mm. they've had a, ended up having a great conversation with their manager and just felt like, oh, like things are going to be okay. I'm going to yeah. find my way through this. Yeah, totally. And um, and the other really good piece of news is that there's now new legislation um, brought in by um, WA, Western Australia, New South Wales and Tasmania, and other states are following uh, fairly closely, um, whereby it's... Um, it's the employer's responsibility to manage um, risks to people's psychological health. Yeah. So every workplace needs to have a strategy to reduce the psychological um, hazards to their workers and then manage them as well. Yeah. Um, and so going to talk to your manager about how you're feeling isn't just bothering them. You're actually um, informing them of a potential hazard here. And if you're yeah. being affected, then it's likely that other people are also getting affected. Yeah, too. exactly. 
Um, so if you make no headway with your manager, sometimes managers um, struggle in these kinds of scenarios and don't know what to say, um, go and talk to the health and safety team because they often have a better idea of um, the um, direct link between workloads or workplace culture mm, with yeah. people's health and well-being. Um, take some time off if you can. See a psychologist because that can really help you um, figure out what part of the workplace is really impacting you the most. Sometimes it takes talking to someone to find your way through and, and better understand it. Mm. And make plans to find a workplace that better protects your mental health. That's, yeah. um, you know, we shouldn't stay somewhere that consistently fails to do that. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, yeah, it's a process and it's not something that comes with like an easy answer, especially if you're kind of trying different ways to combat it. But as long as you're, yeah, making sure that you're putting like your health first and that you're kind of making those steps, um, then yeah, just like give it your, give it your best go, give it your best shot. Yeah. So we're going to move into the practice habit experiment debrief uh, part of the podcast. So this is essentially where um, I ask the professionals and the experts sort of what they do to um, kind of navigate the topic at hand. So obviously we're talking about burnout. Um, so I'm going to ask Marika, uh, what is the practice that you do to overcome burnout at work? Well, um, I have actually burned out before in my career and it was really not pleasant. And so mm. I'm very careful not these days. Not experience. Yeah. No, no. Um, yeah. Particularly if you're someone who's very um, committed to what you want to do and then you find like that you, you no longer that feel that way. It's really um, shocking. So um, what I do is I make sure that I spend more time doing tasks that are personally meaningful. So I make sure that I either outsource or minimize the tasks that I find draining. For me, that means having a receptionist to answer the phone because I hate talking on the phone. Um, <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, so figuring out a work life that really maximizes the stuff that I love. Um, making um, sure that I um, don't have screen time um late at night um or work i don't work late into the night either because that affects my sleep and the final one would be probably um i try and deal with any worries that i have immediately so i figure it out straight away instead of let it sort of letting it work there um yeah, getting bigger okay. and bigger yeah interesting uh, do you find that tends to kind of set the worry is in terms of like making sure that you act on it straight away or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of relate, you know, drawing on cognitive behavior therapy techniques of looking at worries and sort of figuring out, you know, the reality of them and, or the, mm. you know, the, a healthy way to think about them, but also yeah, exactly. um, sort of accepting that, that they can be useful. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We spoke about that earlier today in terms of like, yeah, figuring out, yeah, those worrying thoughts, are they true? Are they helpful? Yeah. All this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so my next question is uh, what are three good things about these practices that you mentioned? I think um, the thing about burnout is that everyone is different and burnout is driven by different things for different people. And so um, – having a good self knowledge for yourself about what it is that you find personally meaningful and enjoyable yeah. and, and motivating in your work life will yeah. likely protect you from burnout, you know, for in the years to come and will help you create a career that's going to um, give you that sense of meaning and purpose that yeah. we all need. Yeah, definitely. And what would you say, uh, like, do you face any challenges when you do these practices? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you sort of, um, you can only get so far on your own. And so sometimes you, you know, you need to discuss it with someone or have a sounding board um, when it comes to figuring out 
what adjustments you need to make in your work life to make things feel mm. better or yeah. less um, stressful and so on. You know, so I, you know, maybe would discuss that with my husband or, you know, a professional or a coach. Um, and so, yeah, there's sometimes staying internal is not enough. We need to actually share our worries and concerns and work yeah. things through. Yeah, definitely. So how do you think this impacts your personal productivity or perception of life, as it says in the question? Um, well, I, I guess um, if you're doing things that are meaningful, you're going to be intrinsically motivated. You're motivated to get things done. And so you're going to yeah. do better in what you're doing and you're going to have more energy to do it. Um, so, you know, I know that if I have to make a phone, phone call, as we know, we both hate that. And so I'll put that off, you know. Um, but if I'm doing something that's meaningful, you know, I will be very engaged in that and yeah. I'll have more energy and passion for that. Yeah. Interesting. And is there anything um, that you would recommend you kind of combine with this practice or, you know, combined with to improve this particular practice? Hmm. Well, I think you can't really attack burnout just from one direction. So you can't yeah. just do say mindfulness and expect that you will never experience burnout. We have yeah. to look at our work life as, you know, a holistic thing and think about, we need that meaning. We need that relaxation. We need that, um, that good sort of relationships with people at work. Um, uh, we need to feel like we're moving forward and growing and learning and that kind of thing. Um, so, so looking at all the parts to your work life, um, yeah. and making sure that you're sort of aware of areas that maybe need improvement in terms of, um, maintaining your wellbeing. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for answering all those questions. We're going to go into audience questions now. Um, yeah. so we just got one question here and this person has asked, when I feel like I'm burning out, I tend to procrastinate and it makes me feel guilty that I would, it makes me feel so guilty that I would become more depressed and no work is done. Hmm. What can I do to break this cycle? Ah, uh, procrastination. Something I'm very familiar with as a university <laughs> lecturer. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess, um, I would first of all, list all the, the excuses that you tell yourself, um, that get in the way. So often it's like, Oh, I need to feel, you know, focused or I need to feel energetic or I need to feel like doing it or I need to mm -hmm. um, have my office perfectly clean before I can start that or, you know, that kind of thing and yeah. recognise when they're coming up and seeing that as, oh, that's just just a thought that gets in the way of me starting this task. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also look at that task and break it down into the tiniest little parts so if you've ever kind of walked into a kitchen and seen a massive dishes that need to be done, you're like, you you want to run away, right? But if you yeah. tell yourself, <laughs> yeah, okay, <clears throat> I'm just going to, um, I'm going to wash the glasses now. Yeah. And then I'll do the rest later. Chances are once you start to wash the glasses, you'll start to feel a little bit less hopeless. You'll start to feel like this isn't so bad. I can get this done. And you yeah. continue on, but really the, <clears throat> the tip, uh, or the trick of, um, you know, getting through procrastination is to set your sights really low and make a really small thing that you need to start yeah. with. Yeah. Um, because that generally is what makes you feel better and feel like you can carry on with what you're doing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think like making those, it's like small, like very achievable goals mm -hmm. can just be like such a nice kind of like yeah. reward system for the brain. It's like, Oh, I yeah. did something. <laughs> yeah. When that's I thought right. that I couldn't do anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it's a if nice you feeling. say that to yourself, I want to write the whole essay. Oh, too much. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Exactly. Instead of that, maybe I want to, you know, um, put the references together or I want to write an introduction or write an outline of it. Yeah, definitely. Mm. We've spoken a lot about like on this show about, um, you know, productivity and what that actually means and how to make it 
achievable in the day-to-day -day life so that we're not, you know, procrastinating and getting to that point of being burnt out, giving ourselves sort of like achievable goals. Cause a lot of the time when we set goals that are not achievable and we expect ourselves to do them in very short amount of time, yeah. we get disappointed and then we don't want to do mm. them anymore and all yeah. this kind of stuff. So yeah, we've spoken a lot about, um, yeah, making small goals mm. and just very, very small, minute, just like achievable mm. things, just like things that you know you're going to do, but then when you do them, you're like, oh, that was nice. Exactly. <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and, yeah. and noticing that you've done it too is, is important. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Yeah. And I think, um, if I, I read uh, Atomic Habits. You probably read that one too. That was that was yeah. pretty good in in terms of developing definitely. new habits and and so on. Um, yeah, but definitely. Yeah, highly I think this time of year is rife for New Year's resolutions and so on. But maybe yes. just thinking about what's important <laughs> to you might be more useful. Yeah, exactly. I think having New Year's resolutions. I know you used to do them when I was younger, but now I'm just kind of like I have just sort of more like aims. Mm. And not so much kind of like resolutions, but it's just mm -hmm. like, you know, this year I want to, you know, look after myself more or, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that I am you know, eating properly or like, mm. you know, and then sort of thinking about, okay, what can I do to actually help get myself sort of to that point mm -hmm. instead of being like, you know, you have to lose 10 kilos or like, you know, yeah. you've got to read 50 books and it's like, Oh, and you put like a, like a number to it. And sometimes mm. that helps people, but like I personally find it just makes me not want to do it. Cause I'm like, exactly. well, if I don't achieve it, then I'm just going to be sad. Yeah. <laughs> just it's like joining a gym. At all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> joining a gym. Yeah. New Year's, New Year's day gyms are always, mm. yeah, that's always interesting. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, moving into the open mic part of the podcast now. So this is where the guest essentially gets to talk about whatever they want to. Um, doesn't have to be related to productivity. It can be about whatever Marika wants to talk about. So mm -hmm. you're essentially the host now. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> Go for your life. Yeah. So I guess, um, I feel, I'm, I feel like this year is going to be a big one for, um, workplaces to, improve employees mental health and that's been um, sort of backed by the legislation now so um, there's actually going to be sort of um, consequences for workplaces that don't um, develop a strategy to sort of assess and manage and um, prevent uh, psychosocial risks so risks to people's psychological health at work um, which to me is a, is a huge breakthrough because up until now, um, you know, burnout and, you know, bullying and other kinds of workplace psychological impacts, it's been seen as sort of uh, a murky area that it's not as important as a physical injury. But the big shift this year is that it's now been made as important as a physical injury. And so I think that listeners can really feel, um, confident in addressing any problems that they're having with their manager because that is part of their role now um and you're allowing and it's, it's like saying hey um that staircase is falling down you know you're helping them by pointing out the hazard because you know someone could break a leg um and the same thing with the work overload or, or the, those other kinds of hazards um so yeah i feel very um positive about this change and our um uh our company the well worker project is really focused on helping um organizations to figure out what their particular hazards are in their workplace mm. and how to um how to manage those and prevent them definitely well. yeah because it'd just be sort of like a bit of a learning curve figuring out what they actually are yeah i think a lot of uh, a lot of employers are sort of grappling with well how do we do this i mean what yeah. you know how do we do workplace mental health but first yeah. of all you need to figure out what you know the lay of the land and what's actually going on for your people yeah yeah exactly so you said that one's been already taken up by wa by wa Tasmania Tasmania and, and new south wales yeah oh. and i think victoria is, is uh, not too far away um, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I was going to say, I could see yeah, the East Coast would be reluctant. They'd be like, oh, come on. Yeah. But generally, <laughs> yeah. there is um, uh, um, Safe Work, uh, was it um, Work Safe Australia? Is, yeah. um, has released sort of guidelines for the, the country on how to, yeah, how to address these psychological um, hazards. That's so, so interesting. I never yeah. really thought we'd, I never thought that that would be like mm. a thing. It just never really occurred to me like, oh, yeah, like, you know, work and all that kind of yeah. stuff and that sucks, but like case there are, like that's what you, that's what happens when you put the human race in a like building. Yeah. But yeah, I guess that's becoming, it's definitely something that people are starting to like take notice of in terms of how it's actually affecting, <clears throat> how it's actually affecting their, their company and the company's yeah. productivity. And, because yeah, I think I <laughs> the, the costs of mental health are so much higher than a physical injury mm. at work. Yeah. So, um, Definitely. The, you know, re rehabilitation is a lot longer and so on. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely within employers' interests to um, do something about it, but now they actually have to have to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Thankfully, yeah, now they actually yeah. have to do something about it. It's sad, though, that we have to kind of get it to a point where it starts to have a financial effect before anyone's mm. like, oh, okay, we should yeah. probably do something about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but thankfully, yeah, we're finally, finally getting something in mm. there, which is great. Yeah. So that pretty much brings us to the end of our show today. Thank you so much, Dr. Marika Lettingham, for being here. It's been so wonderful having you on the show. And we've learned so much about burnout, which I think everyone right. will really enjoy. I love to it's talk about wonderful. burnout, so I'm grateful <laughs> for, for the chance. That's great. Yeah. And for those who want to find out more about you and what you do, uh, where can they go? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, um, Dr. Marika Lettingham, and I am on Instagram. I finally got with the times and I hey. share some burnout um, <laughs> prevention tips on Instagram. And then there's a website, um, the wellworkerproject.com.au. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Well, we'll leave the link to all of that stuff in the description below for those who are interested. And to our listeners, thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. And we'll see you next week. Bye. You have been listening to Work in Progress, the personal productivity science insights podcast produced by the Life Management Science Labs. Listen to episodes from LMSL's 10 Life Management Perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or other podcasting apps on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps others find us and us grow to bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pp.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Tia Hama. Thanks for tuning in.